We're absolutely delighted to have Matt Boyle with us to, he's deciphering debugging, how debugging doesn't need to be hard. So there you go. I'll leave you in the safe hands of Matt Boyle. Thanks, Donald. Uh, sorry for the slow start there. We had a couple of technical issues, what we've got there in the end. Um, cool. So uh, when not at work, I try to be as active uh, in the Go community as I can. So I run one of the largest Go communities on Twitter, or X, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, and I do my best to jump on calls with folks uh, when, I can, uh, when they're having issues that are really hard to describe by text to help them try and figure it out. So on one occasion recently, I jumped on a call with a relatively new gopher who showed me an issue with a web application. They had added log statements, but they were not predictable. Uh, they were not in a predictable order due to concurrency. I suggested they add a breakpoint, to which they responded, what's a breakpoint? Uh, I explained that it allows you to use a debugger to step through code. Um, and they said they'd heard of the debugger, but they, they weren't really sure how it worked, so they hadn't used it. Um, we got their code working, and I like to think they will now be able to use the debugger in future. But this really stuck out to me, because it made me reflect on my own ability to debug, um, and how I've learned all the things that I have. I was never taught it at university. I never did any formal training in it. Uh, and it was all done op opportunistically in a similar situation where I had an issue and someone more senior or with more experience helped me figure it out. I believe being able to debug locally and also in production is a critical skill uh, for any engineer. So I think we should spend more time helping people uh, to figure out how to do this. So in the next 60 minutes or so, probably more like 45 and then some questions, I'm going to give you uh, an overview of the most important things I've learned about debugging. We're going to start from our local machine. When we can run the code, we control the inputs. I'm going to assume no knowledge uh, of anything. But by the end of it, we're going to have distributed tracing set up on our application, which can help us figure out really hard issues. Uh, I'm going to end by sharing some case studies about once you've got your system set up well to be visible and easy to debug, how solving really hard problems becomes really, really easy. Uh, this is the perfect follow-up to Cameron's talk, because a lot of the stuff is only easy because of Go and how easy Go makes it. So I'm Matt Boyle. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Cloudflare. I'm not American, so I'm sorry if I'm a bad speaker. Um, I've wrote a couple of books on Go, and I've made a couple of courses too. My most recent book is on debugging, so if this is interesting to you, uh, check it out. You can get it on Amazon. I also have a few copies in my bag, so come find me and I'll give you one. Uh, so let's set the scene. For the purpose of this presentation, I put together a really simple API. The idea is you give it an input of your budget, uh, and starting from GopherCon, it's going to make a recommendation for a flight you should take and a hotel you should stay at. To do this, it integrates with a flight API, I think something like Skyscanner, and a, and, uh, a hotel API, I think of something like hotel.com. Or who was the sponsor? Love Holidays. Yeah, love Holidays. Um, <laughs> and it makes a recommendation. Uh, we're going to start with a really simple version of the application. Uh, it's not instrumented. It, it's really, really hard to debug. And then we're going to work towards making it more production ready. So let's start by taking a quick look at the code. OK, so I've got a really, really simple application here. So I'm just going to start off by just showing the structure for those that are interested. This is pretty typically how I organize Go applications. So I have the CMD folder, which has a couple of uh, binaries in it split by the name of them. I have an internal package for stuff that I'm not going to export. Um, and then inside that, I'll, I define a lot of my, uh, my business logic. So in the main function, let me just check I'm on the right branch. I am. Um, in the main function, we start a context. We set up a HTTP client. And then we have two services. We have a flight service and a hotel service. I'm going to click into the flight service. Doesn't do very much at all. But you will notice it satisfies a uh, finder interface. So it's got this find function. Um, if I'd have known Love Holidays were sponsoring this, I would have put them instead of British Airways. But we haven't got any business logic here. Like We're just returning the same thing for now, because uh, British Airways are paying me lots of money to put it here, supposedly. Um, we can see our hotel service is a little bit more complicated. It takes the client, and it takes a base URL. So it's probably going to do something a little bit more interesting. Once again, you can see that uh, it satisfies that find interface. So it satisfies this finder. And uh, there's a little bit more logic in here. So we do some business logic to say, if your budget's zero, then I'm really sorry, but you probably can't go very far. Uh, but then we make a HTTP request to a, uh, a remote system. 
Uh, we don't know much about that remote system for now. We just know we're going to make a remote call. Uh, we check to see if the response is okay, and if it is, we decode that response to a response struct, which we've created, which gives back an array of hotel option, which is the name, the price per night in pounds, and the star rating. We then have this very, very smart algorithm, which I devised myself, where we loop through all the hotel options, uh, we take the price per night, we times it by the star rating, and if that's greater than 400, then we return that hotel, because it's clearly great. Um, if uh, none of those satisfy that, then we return the first option. So for those of you who are already great at debugging, you probably spotted a bunch of flaws in my code already, and uh, maybe we'll get to that a little bit later. So once we've created these two services, we compose them into this recommendation service. Uh, the recommendation service does some business logic of its own in that it uh, checks your budget again. This time, it not only checks if it's too small, it checks if it's uh, too large as well. If that's supposed to say big spender, I'm not going to change it because we're in my git commit history. Um, and then we call the hotel finder, we call the flight finder. If either of those error, we return an error, but otherwise we return a recommendation. And then finally, we compose those together into this new mux function. So I'm using the uh, go122 server here. Uh, we pull the budget off the request, check it's all good. If it's not, we give a bad request. Uh, we make a call to our recommendation service, and we give uh, a budget out of bounds error if you're too low or too high in your budget and give back a bad request. Anything else goes wrong with this, we give back a 500. So it's all somewhat reasonable, right? Like you can see a world where this is a, a pretty reasonable first pass of an application. But then this is where things go a little bit wrong. So uh, we get this Jira ticket, this Jira ticket gets raised to us saying the customer is getting a 500 error for a really large budget. So given an input of 500,000, a user is receiving a 500 response from the API, but no further information. Is this meant to happen? Can we give clearer feedback? We've all had tickets like this in the past, right? Um, so let's try this in Postman. The input's very clear here. So this is something that we can probably recreate locally, I imagine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to Goland, and I'm just going to run this server. It might take a moment, because I've still only got an Intel Mac. Uh, and make a request. And look, I do get a 500, so this is, this is great. I can debug this because it's really easy to recreate locally. But you'll notice that my application isn't giving me any insights at all. There's no logs here. There's, n there's nothing to tell me what went wrong. So we've already put ourselves in a bad spot. Like The whole point of uh, our, our role is to give, deliver customer value, and we haven't set ourselves up for success here. Like We have a system that we don't know anything about, and our customers are seeing issues, and they're telling us about it rather than us being able to tell them about it and fix it. So my first advice when debugging anything is if it's not time sensitive, then take your time and try and debug it by eye. So what I mean by this is try and read the code um, and understand why this has happened without adding any logs or doing anything further. Imagine the code base is a pull request and you're attempting to find potential issues in it. This will get you much more comfortable reading Go code, especially code that you didn't write, and this will make you a better engineer. The next thing I would typically do in this situation is write a test. Tests are a great way to test a lot of scenarios quickly and give you confidence to make changes to the code base going forward. Uh, fin um, finally, tests will ensure that we, need we get a big red X in CI uh, if we make a change that breaks uh, what we're about to put in the fix. Uh, for this purpose of this talk, I'm not going to talk too much about it because it's a big topic, and I've seen plenty of excellent talks at GopherCon. I even see there's a, there's a talk this year about testing, so you should go and watch that. Uh, so what's our next step? Ideally, we want to add some visibility here. We're going to talk about logs and metrics in a second, but for now, let's just talk about the debugger briefly. Uh, so Cameron talked a little bit about this, about how Go has like a debugger built into it, and that makes, in my experience, Go one of the easiest languages to debug I've ever worked with. It's one of the most powerful tools available to you, um, and once you've kind of done that debugging by eye, or if it is more time sensitive, this is a great place to get stuck in. So today, our example is going to be a little bit contrived, but I'm going to show you very quickly how you can use a debugger to find issues quickly. Being able to pause execution of complex code so that you can step through it at your own pace is really useful, and this is what the debugger allows us to do. Furthermore, by using a debugger, we can keep track of more, ex uh, of more expressions in our application that we can keep in our head. So let's step through our code using the debugger and see if we can diagnose the 500 issue. I'm using Golan, but everything I'm about to show you is possible in VS Code or pretty much any other IDE. So let's jump back here, and what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to move these a second, sorry. And, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into server. 
go, which I think is what it's called. Maybe not. I'll just do it this way. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click in the gutter here. So by clicking in the gutter here, in Goland at least, it shows this little red dot. By clicking that, it means that I'm interested in stopping my application here. So it won't do it automatically. But once I run my application in debug mode, it's now going to give me the option uh, to, to pause my code here. So the really nice thing about Go is all I have to do is trigger my application to hit there. And that's all the setup I need to do to get the debug running. So I'm going to make the same request that I made a second ago. And I actually get transported back to Goland. And you can see my application is paused. So we can step through this now and figure out exactly why we were getting the 500. So I have a couple of options. I can step over here, which will take me to the next line. Or if I want to, I could step into it. And that's going to take me into the path value function. Um, if you're not too sure what all the functions do, you can just keep stepping into until you discover the error, which is really useful. I have some theories about where it is. So in the interest of time, I'm going to step over. So I can step over, and we can see that we successfully passed the value off the path value. So this is great. We're already in a good spot where things are working up to now. So now we're going to attempt to pass the int. Again, we can see that it passed successfully, and we did not get an error. So we really are stepping through our application line by line and evaluating it. So I'm going to step over again. We didn't hit this bad request, and we're now in our service.get function. So I'm going to step over this one more time. And it's evaluating the errors. And you can see we've just hit the 500 case. So uh, we didn't receive this error back. Our rec, which is here, is nil. And you can see down here that I've got an error. And the error in this instance is that my connection refused. I got connection refused calling localhost 8080. If you remember, if we go back to main.go, you'll see that's what we were passing in here. So what's happened in this instance is I locally, I don't have this hotel service running. But it's given us a tip of what our customer might be experiencing. This is probably a configuration issue. And these are notoriously difficult to, to catch because uh, your local environment, your staging environment, your production environment are all going to have different values here. And so these are really tricky ones to catch at times. But we figured this out. So we know roughly why this happened. We've got a clue of what we can go and investigate in, in production now to see if we can uh, see the same issue our customer was experiencing. Uh, I think I missed the slide. Yeah, so uh, we, we figured out the issue. Uh, but what if, we, what if this happened in production, like, um, with, like we saw with this issue by our customer? We may want to get a little bit more information about the error we're seeing. Right now, we have a theory that our customer is seeing the same issue we are, but we don't have any proof of that. We can go and mess around with configuration in production, which is not recommended. Or we could find a way to give ourselves more insight. And logs are a great place to do that if you're kind of at this point in your uh, maturity journey towards uh, better debugging and better observability. So as of Go 121, Go added a structured logger, which is called slog or slog, depending who you ask, uh, to the standard library. It's my view that you can consider this a sensible default. And if you're looking at logging for your application, you should always use this. If you're not familiar with structured logging, you'll see why this is useful now. So let's go back to my code. Uh, we're going to add some structured logs to it. And then let's see what it looks like after that. Let's move some stuff around again. So I'm just going to check out uh, checkpoint two. Cool. And we're going to jump back into main.go. OK. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a log file. You don't have to log to a file, but you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm importing slog from the standard library. And I'm making a new JSON handler. We'll talk in a moment a little bit about why uh, I'm using a JSON handler and the advantage that gives us. One thing I'm doing, which is a tiny bit controversial, is I then take that log and I'm putting it inside the context. Uh, the reason I do that is because uh, if you don't do this, logging has to become part of every single API you wrote. And I don't think it should. I think it's an application level thing. So although a lot of people kind of feel weird about embedding the log in the context, I think this is a pretty good use case for it. And we do this quite a lot at Cloudflare. And for what it's worth, I found this pattern because I saw Google do it. So um, in 2020, Google open sourced their, um, it was a server for COVID for like tracking the movement of people and making sure you didn't interact with people. And this is how they uh, did logging inside the application. So it's where I learned it. it. Makes me feel a little bit better about doing it. Um, so if you, if you jump into this new Mux function now, you'll see we've made a couple of changes. Uh, the main one being that I can pull my logger out of the context and I can log an error. 
I tend to log like this where I have, uh, the message I'll give is like, um, usually like an underscored version of, of the call being made, which makes it really easy to find. Uh, and then I always make sure you log the error so you obviously don't lose any context. So let's make a request again. And because I'm logging to an, uh, a file, we're obviously not going to see anything in the console, but I can show you it show up in, a, in the log file. So let me open that now. And it's pretty big, so I seeded it with some data for reasons you'll see in a moment. Uh, you can see I've got lots and lots of this log. Um, so one thing you, you can see here is in JSON format. Like J JSON format um, like makes sense for machines, but maybe not so. Maybe it's not so clear why we're doing this to uh, for humans. Um, but there's there's a very good reason for for doing this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk you through why that now is now. So once you have your logs in a structured format, uh, this is the sort of visibility you can achieve with them. So you can submit structured logs to a specialized tool. This one is Kibana. Um, but there are many other tools you can do this with. The reason I show this one is it's open source. So if you don't have any visibility like this today, you could run this yourself for free. As you can see, the tool understands the structure of our logs and can parse logs into timestamp. It can show JSON keys. And we can filter on um, what we think is interesting at this moment in time. So if you have a Go application running in production, I would say this is the minimum level of visibility you should have uh, before you're kind of serving customers. So let's see uh, what our application looks like when we submit our logs to a tool like this. So I'm, again, I'm just going to jump back to my code, and I'm just going to run Docker Compose up. And while that's loading, let me show you my Docker Compose file so you can see what I'm actually doing. So in Docker Compose here, I'm running Elasticsearch, which is like the back end for Kibana. This is where all our logs are going to live. And then we have Kibana, which is the front end piece, which is going to give us the visibility. So I'm just going to jump back to my terminal and hopefully see if it's ready yet. Sorry, it's more Intel Mac problems here. And one thing I can check while I'm waiting, actually, is Kibana is going to be running on localhost 5601. So we can, we can get ourselves there ready. Looks like we nailed the timing, and it's just become available as I typed it. So it's perfect. OK, so once you have logs in a file like I have, uh, there's a few different options you have. So you don't have to log to a file. Like, there are tools that can kind of scrape standard out and push them to tools like this. But one of the easiest ways to use this is to use a tool called FileBeat. And FileBeat can just, it just basically checks a file continuously to see if there's any new logs. And then it can push it to a tool like Elasticsearch. Um, before I show you that, one thing I do want to show you is uh, this as well. So I do this quite often, but for um, a lot of visibility type things, like metrics and for logs, if you wanted to build dashboards, um, you've got kind of got two options, right? You either wait until you get a whole bunch of data that you can build dashboards on top of. You can guess uh, like what those dashboards might look like when you have a certain amount of data, or you can create the data. And I tend to choose the last option. So what I do fairly often is I write function, uh, small binaries like this. I call them seeders. And effectively, as, what, what this is going to do is it's going to make thousands of requests as fast as it can to recreate the situation that I just discussed where I was getting a 500 back, which is going to trigger a whole bunch of logs being written to that file, which then means I can very easily create dashboards and things like that to make sure it's working how I want it to before I put it into production. This is particularly important when you're thinking about uh, getting visibility over metrics, but I'll, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit shortly. Um, so now we've got a, I'm not going to run the, the seeder today because I, I already have a huge application log file. But um, for the purpose of this demonstration, what you can do is you can up, just upload a file straight to uh, Elasticsearch to make sure it does what you want it to. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to take this application log file and I'm going to attempt to scroll. Oof, struggling a bit. OK, that didn't work. Let's try again. OK, I don't know what's happened there. This usually works. Let me try one more time. No. Uh, I wonder if I can find it quickly. i tell you what I can do. I can do this, and then this. But there in the end. 
And what you can see Elasticsearch does is it looks at the file very quickly, and because we've used JSON, we've used a structured format, it can look at the file and go, oh, I understand a ton of stuff about this. I can see that you regularly, in 100% in of these documents, you have the log level. In 100% of these documents, you have message. In 100% of them, you have time. And uh, in this instance, in 100% of them, you have uh, unhandled error with distinct values. But if you use these same fields all the time, um, you can start to build what we call indexes in Elasticsearch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import this. And I have to give it a name, so I'm just going to type something random in for now. Uh, and it's going to process it and create that index for us. Cool. And let's see what that looks like. So um, imagine this is a, pro a production application, and we're looking at our dashboard to figure out if things have gone wrong over time. I can do filters on things here, so I can say only show me ones that have error logs. And if I was looking at this, I'd say, okay, there's two distinct events that have happened here. Some point over here, things went wrong, and something over here, things went wrong. So let's zoom in on this. Uh, we can expand this out. We can do things like look at surrounding documents, which will show you things that happened around that time. The level of visibility we've just gained versus what we had a minute ago when we didn't have any logs is huge. And so if you're starting from somewhere where you have no visibility at all, just by logging and having a way to push them into a log tool gives you so much more than you had before. The other powerful thing you can do as a starting point until you have a little bit more maturity around this is you can alert on these too. So instead of the customer having to raise a Jira ticket to say, I'm getting this error, we'd, we'd fix it before they had the chance to raise a ticket because we'd be notified. So th this is my favorite slide. The reason for that is I spent ages coming up with things to put on it, and I couldn't think of any image that represented what I wanted, so I just put a log on there in the end. So it took me longer than any other slide to put this together, and it's just a picture of a log. Um, so logs are usually people's first exposure to debugging. We've all spammed console.log or format.println everywhere to, to find issues in the past, but they can be really valuable. Um, the thing that's the warning I want to give is it's very easy to add too many logs. Um, so even in, if you go back to this dashboard, there's a lot going on here, right? If there really was an issue in production and you were trying to figure out what's going on, this could be really difficult to work through. You'd also see the logs are at various levels here. We've got info, debug, info, debug. None of the ones here are actually showing up as error logs. So we're going to have to do some filtering to figure out exactly what we want to do. Um, so I find logs work best at the edge of your system. So you probably noticed that my log was in the transport layer, um, which is typically where I'll try and bubble errors up to, and I'll log them all there. Um, I also will log in the main function, too. If you do this, it keeps logs concentrated. And when I follow the strategy, I tend to get logs at the right level. Generally, I recommend starting just by logging errors and exceptional things that go wrong. Uh, and I tend to use debug as um, a log level that I can use, but I leave it turned off and I use an environment variable to turn it on, so I can turn up the noise if I want to to solve a specific issue if I'm not getting enough uh, from everything else that I have. So I've, given you the war I've just given you a warning not to log too much, right? But that's really tough. Um, if you want, the reason you're gonna add logs to your application, uh, or the reason that I'm telling you what to go home and clean them up is, you're gonna be saying, well, I put them there for a reason. I wanted to know about that thing. There was a point in time that was useful to me, so why do I have to remove it? Um, and if you're in this situation, this is where metrics are a great option. So uh, metrics are a great option for higher volume data points and things you care about uh, at aggregate. So things like how many requests, how slow are requests, like how long are things taking. So instead of logging every request, we could use a metric for each request that hits our server, which would allow us to build dashboards to monitor the rate, the error, and duration of all these requests we're receiving. So let's go back to our code base and see what it looks like to add metrics too. And let's see if we get another Jira ticket that we might be able to debug with this, uh, with this new visibility. So I need to remember to do Docker Compose down or I regret it later. So I'm going to do that now. And then. Cool. So I'm going to jump into, um, I'm back in my router.go. So this is like my transport layer, if you will. And you'll see that I've imported. Um, my second dependency of, of this talk, uh, which is Victoria metrics, metrics. And I create two metrics here. One is request total, and one is request duration seconds. So you'll see that when a request comes in, I measure the start time, and then I defer the record duration of, of the request. Which all it does is it does time since, and then it updates it to say this request took this long. The other thing I do now is um, 
let me find it, is I have this HTTP error function. And what it does is it logs errors, uh, it writes the status, but it also gets or creates a counter of how many requests I've had and the HTTP status in response. So by adding a couple of lines of code now, I now have the ability to uh, get some logs. I also have the ability to see how many requests uh, have been made to my application by status code, which by proxy allows me to figure out which ones were successful, which ones weren't, um, and potentially things like rate limits. Um, which, so uh, by adding effectively these two lines, I've just given myself a whole bunch of new visibility that I didn't have before. So if we run this application again, you'll see that uh, these metrics are exposed on uh, an endpoint called slash metrics. And we also turned on this option, which is expose process metrics. So I'm going to jump back into Postman. And we're just going to make a request to that endpoint so I can show you what it looks like. So hopefully you can see that on the screen. Um, let me take chaser. Not XML. <laughs> um, so as you can see, we've got tons of information now, arguably too much. But we can see things like how much memory is being used by Go. We can see what Go version is being used, how it was compiled, um, how long the, the garbage collection is taking. So just by adding like a couple of lines of code, we now have access to whole new levels of visibility. We're in a very similar spot to before uh, in, with structured logs, though, where this is interesting, right? But it's not very helpful. Like, I can't do very much this information. I'm not going to sit and read these every few seconds to see if they're, if they're giving me uh, something useful. But um, effectively, these are going to update in every, every few seconds. You can see the values are moving. So we've got almost real-time insight into how our system's running in production now, exposed in this endpoint. So now all we need to do is find a way to get them into a tool that's actually useful for us, a format that humans can use. So let's talk about that a little bit. So once you've got this all configured, you can make dashboards such as this one. As you can see at a glance, you can figure out what the slowest endpoints are, you can see the error rate over time, and you can make very quick decisions about what's going on in your system. A lot of places I've worked will have this up on big screens with key metrics that the company's tracking on them. This can be really useful to highlight what's important to you and your business and to ensure everyone's on the same page. Ensuring you're measuring the right thing is not a science, and it can be really hard to get right. Just like logs, it can be very easy to have thousands of metrics that might be interesting to monitor, but they might actually slow you down when you're trying to debug a production issue because they add noise. If this is your first time monitoring application or your first time using metrics, I recommend monitoring for red. Red stands for rate, uh, which is the number of requests per second, uh, or minute if it's a slower system. Error is the number of requests that are failing, so these might be seen as non-2xx requests. Um, and duration is how long these requests are taking. If you monitor these things, you cannot go too far wrong. They are also arguably a really good proxy metric for, cu for customer happiness. A slow, error-prone API will make customers deeply unhappy with any system. Uh, so actually, let's go back a bit first. So if we go back to this dashboard again, you'll see that's exactly what this is monitoring. Uh, in the top left here, this, uh, this top segment here, we're, we're monitoring request rate. We're doing it per endpoint here, but effectively all we're doing is seeing how long things, uh, t yeah, how many requests we're receiving. In the top right, we've got uh, how many errors we're receiving. This one's really nice because it's color coded too. So as a human at a glance, I can go, oh, our overall error percentage is actually in a pretty good spot. Like I don't need to take any action here. And then for specific endpoints, we're like, oh, this is actually breaching what we deem to be acceptable. Maybe I should go and investigate in this area. And then finally, we've got latency down here where you can see how long each specific endpoint is taking. So it actually takes a, it's a really, really uh, difficult thing to be able to make dashboards that are this, like, look this good and are as helpful as these are. I, I'm not bragging. I didn't write this. I found this online. Um, but this is a really, really good dashboard. It gives you all the information you need, nothing more. And I, I think this is a great place to start if you're, if you're just trying to figure out how to get going with metrics. So use red. So this is the slide where I said I would post another Jira ticket um, with another class of error we could debug now that we have metrics. There are two things like that that would exist, except if we wait for people to start raising Jira tickets, it's probably too late. Me metrics can be configured to be re near real time, and volumes are less of an issue as logs. I also mentioned that mostly with metrics, we care about things that happen as an aggregate, not individual is isolated cases. So in this instance, for things that we monitor with metrics, we probably want to move more towards alerting proactively than waiting for customers to tell us about it. So here's something that you, you may see if you set up your uh, metrics to, al to alert on your metrics. So we've said for this specific system that it should have a, uh, 
a target of having like 99% uptime, that means that anything, as we're starting to trend away from that, we're starting to use our error budget. Uh, and if we continue how we're trending, we're gonna, we're gonna breach our uh, objective. And there may, for some companies, and depending on, on how you operate, there may even be financial consequences for doing that. So it's really, really important to, to start thinking about these things and to make sure you're aware of what commitments you're making to your customers. And also, as an engineering team, like, what do you want to commit to? Nobody wants to run a system that's broken, but also achieving six nines of uptime is incredibly difficult. So finding the, the middle ground is, is really important. Um, this is a message that you might see show up in Slack. Sending alerts to Slack is like a really popular um, uh, use case. It's a really good way to get notified of things that are going wrong where you work, which can be a really great place to jump off into debugging, especially if off of this, um, off of this alert, you have links to runbooks, to help, to support, to how you can fix this very, very quickly. Maybe it links to the dashboard I just showed you, and you can see very quickly what's going on. Um, but you want to make sure that alerts are actionable, and they actually prompt an action. Um, they should be linking to the runbook, as I mentioned, and it should help you solve the issue. If you find that alerts are showing up and you're just snoozing them or deferring them, you should probably delete it. Uh, alert fatigue is a really real thing, and the last thing you want to do is uh, be calling engineers out at night or even in the daytime when they're trying to get other things done to, to notify them of things that actually aren't that interesting to them at the time. So let's go back here. Um, if we were looking at this, we can see the slowest endpoint is currently the login endpoint. This gives, up a jumping off, this gives us a jumping off point to begin investigating, but we still need to debug why it's slow. We now know that it is slow, but we, we don't have any more insight as to particularly why. If we look back at our application, we'd see a few different areas uh, where we might figure out where our code is slow. We've got business logic itself. If we had something where we were doing a whole bunch of calculations, it might be reasonable that we had a block of code in there that was really slow. We have the Hotel Finder API. Uh, for now, that's really simple. It's not doing very much. But we do have the Flight Finder API, which is making a remote call to a different system. And in most other applications you're going to work with in your career, you're probably going to have a database too. All of these things can be expensive, and to some extent, unavoidably so. For example, if you're going to charge a customer and you want to call Stripe, and Stripe is being slow that day, you, you can't make Stripe faster. You have no ability to do that. However, what you can do is you can define what is an acceptable waiting time for your customers, and perhaps you have a fallback interaction that triggers if it is being too slow for you. But before we start making plans for slow API calls that we haven't proven exist yet, we need to figure out what is slow and why. Um, we have a few choices here. We could manually instrument various areas of our code with lots of metrics for each API call, which would work. Uh, but, but as I mentioned, metrics are great for aggregated things. What if there's a handful of users that are seeing uh, much slower response times than everyone else? What if they happen to be located in specific locations that we don't have good visibility on? There's another tool we can use for this, which is distributed tracing or open telemetry. So distributed tracing allows us to get a granular insight into where a request in our system is spending time. It allows us to embed context-specific data in the trace, things as request path, or even entire logs. Another way of saying this is metrics are great for when you want to consider something in aggregate, but tracing excels at zooming in on specific requests. So let's see what it looks like to add tracing to our system, too. Add bits down here again a sec. I'm going to run Docker Compose up now preemptively in case it's a little slow. OK. Uh, so again, we're in uh, roots.go, and we've imported two more libraries this time. Uh, getting started with OpenTelemetry is a tiny bit harder than everything else we've seen, but it's, it's still not too bad. So we've imported OpenTelemetry HTTP. Uh, there's also one for gRPC. There's one for pretty much everything you can think of. There's one for Kafka, so you can see messages pass through the system there, too. And there's one for Trace. Uh, Trace allows us to start specific uh, spans, which we'll see in a moment. So all I've done here is uh, I've wrapped uh, my HTTP handler in an OpenTelemetry one that adds the root parameter to my requests. And then I've done, let me close this. I create a new span from context. So I pull the request out of the context. Uh, the reason we do it this way is what this will do is if a request comes in that has open telemetry data in it, we'll continue that span. We'll see why that's important in a moment. Uh, and then we pull out a tracer, which I've called GovCon 2024. I've started my own span here, uh, which is called get recommendation, and I end it here. 
So what I'm saying is like this block of code between these two things is important to me. I'm really interested in what's going on here and I want to see how long we're spending time here. In my service function, I make two more spans. I use the same tracer. Um, and in this one, what I'm doing is I'm making a new uh, tracer, a new trace, sorry, called get hotel. And what I'm doing here is I'm ending it after I've done uh, the business logic of this piece. But I've also added some, uh, some an event, uh, which in this case is kind of like a log, right? Uh, hotel selected, and I've embedded the hotel that's been actually made as a choice inside the trace. So this is really powerful. Say we're using multiple providers, and we saw we, we had a theory, or we were getting sort of reports that uh, certain providers or certain hotels were being so slower to respond. This would give us the insight we needed to be able to make that conclusion. And then I do exactly the same thing around get flight. Uh, so we do that here too. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run my server for the final time. And let's make a request. And it's slow, which is good. And we can see we got back our first successful response today, which is you should go to Hotel A on, on British Airways. So the other, the other thing I wanted to show you quickly before we jump into Jaeger is I just want to show you my Docker Compose file again. So getting Jaeger started up is really, really nice. They have a really, really simple setup where you can use this all-in-one Docker file, which, um, which contains the UI, a collector, a gRPC one, and something called Zipkin. Uh, and then I also ran my hotel API for the first time on port 8080. So I'm going to jump over to Jaeger UI now. And I'm going to press Find Traces. And you can see that I can zoom in on specific operations if I wanted to. I could look at specific only get flight calls if I wanted to. But what I can do here is I'm going to look at that whole request I just made and, and see where we're spending the time. So if we've had a report that it's slow, you can see that the request takes 2.01 seconds in total, which is, which is pretty slow for what we're doing. Um, if we look into why that was, we can see that um, the start time for the request was in the microseconds. The get hotel call was actually really quick. Um, it started after 10 milliseconds, and it took 112 microseconds to complete. And we can also see that log that we embedded. So I can see the hotel selected, and the hotel A is in here. And then if I expand get flight, we can see that get flight took two seconds. Like this is where we need to optimize our code. If we're seeing timeouts, or we're getting feedback from people that our, our system's slower, we're getting alerts because we're breaching our um, duration, like SLOs. This is what we need to look at. So we've been able to take a specific request, look it up in Jaeger, and go, OK, for certain scenarios, certain classes of people, we're taking way too long res to respond. We've now got our jumping off point to go and investigate and figure out why our application is slow. In, uh, in our example, it's very easy. It's because I put um, time.sleep. But... So this might be the class of ticket that you either get raised or the insight you get from customers which can help you jump off and figure this out is certain applications or certain debug tools will grab something like a trace ID, right? And uh, I can take the trace ID here and I can throw it into my tool here like Jaeger and look up their specific request. And so if we are seeing specific situations where certain customers are having a slower experience than average, because that's one bad thing about Prometheus, right? If you set it up well, you can look for outliers, but generally it's looking for aggregates. And so these outliers can sometimes get lost. And it's really important to make sure that all customers have a good experience, right? Especially as these outliers are usually the ones that can help you figure out deficiencies in your system. Uh, so one example I have here is let's say you have an application where you can uh, add resources, you can add widgets. And the average customer, the typical customer, adds five widgets to your application. But you don't have an upper bound defined. There will be a customer who adds 5,000. And you may not have thought about this in your business logic. You may not have your database set up for this. And these outliers are going to be the ones that help you tune and figure out what constraints you need to have in your system to account for the fact that, although on average people use five, our system allows for 5,000. And somebody is going to do that. I mentioned about pulling the request out of the context. And we also want to make sure that we forward that request too with the context. That's because what OpenTelemetry does under the hood is it embeds um, inside of the context. We look for specific headers that exist. And we, by propagating them through our requests within a distributed system, we can build maps that look like this. Um, this is incredibly useful because you can see I can look what our system looked like 15 minutes ago. I can look what it looked like an hour ago. I can see what it looks like yesterday. And if everybody uses this standard, 
as you add new microservices into your systems, they'll just show up on this graph here. And you can even configure the lines between requests to show the request rate, the error rate, and the duration. You can make them go red if things are, if flow between two specific systems isn't going well. If one's giving rate limit responses, you can see all that here. So let's review where we came from and where we ended up. So we started with an application, that, and we didn't really have any insight into why things were going wrong. We added some basic logs to help us debug after using the debugger locally. And most folks I reckon here would be familiar with that. Console.log is probably one of the first debugging techniques we ever learned. And you can get surprisingly far with it. Like I, I know very senior engineers who still use this and they're really productive this way, and that, that's totally cool. Um, but from there, we moved on to structured log, and we took a step forward in our maturity journey. We saw that uh, we could filter out noise, look for patterns over time frames, and we could index on specific things. We then talked about metrics, and now they can help us view our system in aggregate. And finally, we looked at distributed tracing, where it's easy to look at outliers and see how our system works as a whole. Observability and debugging are intertwined. It doesn't need to come all at once to have this level of visibility, and it is going to be a journey. Some companies go straight from logging all the way to distributed tracing. If you use tools like Datadog, it makes it easy to put all of this stuff in one place. But I find that you know, winning buy-in from like, executives or from senior engineers in your team to spend the time here, this journey works because you can see incremental improvements. And each step is a tiny bit, probably a tiny bit more expensive to get set up correctly than the last. But moving from no logging to having logging that's structured is a fairly easy ask. Once people understand that, moving to metrics is a fairly easy ask. And then when you go, hey, check this out, and you show them the service graph, people love it. Um, improving this over time is, is a journey. Um, and you need to be honest about where your observability in your system is failing you, right? Um, so if you have an incident or if you have an issue, make sure you have a post-mortem. And don't just discuss about what went wrong. Discuss about what took, why did it take you so long to get to a solution. And that isn't an attack on a person. It should be blameless. But it should be more framed as, you know, it took us 45 minutes to go from uh, the issue to fix. Like, why was that? And it might be, I didn't know which dashboard to use. We didn't have a dashboard that tracked that. I had no visibility into that class of problem. Uh, our customers raised it before us, so we'd already be seeing the incident for 20 minutes because our alerts were set to only fire after 20 minutes. All of these things can be tweaked, but you've got to be honest and have open conversations about them. So before handing it over to you all for questions, I wanted to tell you a, a debugging story from, from the real, real world, something that's happened to me. Um, so this is a, one of the most complex things I ever worked on. Um, a few years ago, I built a product for Cloudflare called Crawler Hints. The concept is really cool. We forward content from Cloudflare's Edge to a system in our control plane that figured out um, if a page has new content, if it's changed, or if it's a new page com completely. And if it was, uh, we forward it to our search engine partners. This turns the whole process of search on its head. As you all know, most of the internet today is built on crawlers. They go around websites just checking constantly for new content. But that's a really inefficient way to build things if you think about it. Most websites don't change. There's a small class of them, especially like news websites, that change all the time. But uh, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I'm sure other people are here. How many people haven't updated their personal website in like three years, right? But uh, Index is going to check that regularly. So we can turn that whole thing on its head. Uh, Cloudflare is in a unique position to say, we've seen some content changes here. Let's, let's let our search uh, engine partners know about it. Um, the volume here was, was big from day one. So in the first couple of days, we were seeing sort of 18 to 30,000 requests a second. And we're seeing 100 times that amount coming through the system now. The really interesting thing about this class of system is speed is critical. Content freshness is only interesting for a few seconds. If you imagine that you went and updated your uh, personal website twice in five minutes, which is really common, you make a commit, oh, I made a mistake, I'll make another one. Like, we don't care about the first one anymore, right? Only the second one is interesting. And we need to keep the order, too. The order is really important. Uh, so due to the speed we needed here, logs were not a great option. Uh, they slow the, uh, logs are great, but having too many of them can slow down like, critical systems. And by the time we've ingested them, most of the logs are not relevant to us anymore. So metrics were our best friend here. We monitored for red, as well as for some other metrics that we were concerned could be due to, uh, that could be problematic due to the type of system this is. So what, as well as the red metrics I talked about, we also monitored CPU utilization, memory utilization, and we were, run, we were running huge Redis clusters for this. So we monitored the, um, the memory utilization of them as well. Finally, because we were submitting uh, information to search engine indexes, 
We also measured the response uh, code and response time that we were sending to them too. So this system is one that ramped up really quickly, uh, but it still was effectively a curve over time. Customers could opt in uh, and out as they wanted to, um, but it was a really popular product. And we found that things were working really well for a while, but after a couple of weeks, we started to see slower response time from our search indexes. And then we started to see some of our alerts fire because we were getting rate limit responses. Thanks to the good visibility we had, we did not need to spend too long debugging this, and, uh, in this uh, to understand what was wrong. We could add some artificial delays into our system uh, that allowed us to just about keep up with, uh, with content freshness, uh, but also satisfy our search engine indexes who could only cope, well, were only allowing a certain amount of rate through. And because they were partners, we could work with them in this instance to increase our rate limit. But this stopped it from being a production incident because we got, we got ahead of it and we had the visibility in place that we could very, very quickly make the changes we need to. And within sort of a few minutes of the alert firing, we'd, we'd made the changes we needed to do to, to fix it. Uh, so thanks so much for listening. Uh, all the code of this presentation is available on my GitHub, um, and I'll share it on Twitter too. Um, I'm at Boyle, and I'd love to answer any questions anyone has about anything I've discussed today. Hey, uh, yeah, uh, so really interesting talk. Um, we've kind of had a lot of the same problems uh, in our system, or you know, same kind of experiences of moving from structured logging to metrics. And then, uh, well, actually, my question is related to why we haven't moved to tracing, which is we use Datadog, which is a really great tool. <laughs> I know where this is going. Uh, it's but, expensive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I was just wondering if you have any tips on like, you know, dealing with the cost issue and you know, how do you get your CFO to agree to shout yeah. out for, for these kinds of products? Yeah, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's a great question. And that's the, that's the underlying, like the undertone with everything I've discussed here is if you are going to use cloud services for these things, they can get expensive, right? And I think this comes back to my uh, warning around um, only sort of creating logs that you need, uh, reviewing your metrics regularly, reviewing your traces regularly to make sure that you're only ingesting things that are valuable to you and that you're using to, to solve like production issues, right? Um, so one thing that's really useful with tracing specifically is sampling. You can, you can sample traces, and the most important ones are the outliers. So a lot of tools will allow you to sample for outliers, like show me the slowest request, show me the error prone request. Not so, in, you know, take a small sample of successful ones, but they're not that interesting to us, right? Especially after a period of time. So I think that would be my advice. Um, and I think the other, the other piece is, instead of just reducing costs, is like uh, focusing on um, opportunity cost. So every minute that an engineer is working on an incident, they're not working on delivering like a further piece of functionality that might help you achieve your next fundraising round or, you know, help you IPO, whatever it might be. And trying to give a view of what that looks like is, is very helpful for making the case that we should, uh, you know, this is worth time spent. It, you know, in the example I gave, if I can solve a production issue in five minutes instead of an hour, uh, especially if your company's got a culture around uh, incidents like Cloudflare does, if an incident fires at Cloudflare, effectively every engineer is empowered and encouraged to get involved to fix it as quickly as possible. If you kind of cost that out as productivity loss, it's really expensive, and so suddenly some of these bills for tracing and metrics don't seem so expensive. There's a question here, I think. Hi. Uh, so just speaking about, like, you mentioned a bit sort of noisy alerts. Uh, we have some systems that we depend on that are less reliable than we'd like, so we'd found that we'd getting error alerts frequently, or regularly rather than frequently sort of thing, but they weren't helpful because it was just the unreliable system was being unreliable. Um, so we settled on having like multiple uh, periods before we'd alert. Do you have any other advice for like kind of dealing with things like that where you know something's unreliable, but as you want to know if it's being more unreliable than usual, I guess? I think that's a, that's a really great comment. So. If a system is known to be, I talked a little bit about like SLOs, like, you know, and people usually talk about three nines or four nines or five nines of uptime, right? Where if, uh, if you're building a brand new cutting edge system and it's critical to business, you might say only having five minutes of downtime a month is acceptable. Otherwise, it, you know, it impacts our, our core business. If you have a system that's unreliable, it's completely reasonable to set the SLO substantially lower to account for the fact that you know it's unreliable, right? 
if over a typical period you can achieve 80% of uptime, let's say, that's when I would be alerting, when it goes beyond what is typical. It's all about finding like, what's a good fit for a business risk and like, what you're trying to achieve and what's acceptable for your team and just making sure you're only taking action when it's necessary. For example, if you know that it, it does go down all the time, calling you out is not going to be helpful. Um, and by setting the, having that conversation about we're actually only going to maintain we're only going to make, uh, call ourselves out and make change to the system if we're down for more than an hour a month. You might find that triggers a conversation within your company. It's like, we have a system that's going down for two hours a month. We need to invest there. And it could give you the case to go and invest the time to make it more reliable. So having these conversations around uh, service level objectives is really, really valuable for figuring out with uh, like non-technical people like how important systems actually are and what is acceptable in terms of, of downtime. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, have you ever uh, run into um, an issue with a huge um, span, uh, which actually, you know, like the, all the monitoring observability system, it's affecting uh, production in, in a way? Like, I don't know, um, taking too much time and reducing the, the or increasing the, re the, the time response or eating a lot of memory? Um, have you had any of that? Yeah, we, we, I've seen issues before where uh, effectively every system was starting its own span and then its own children's span, and you ended up with these really messy, long, yeah, exactly. Usually the issue there just comes down to configuration, and the, typically I've found that when that happens, it's because people aren't propagating it through, so they're starting a new span rather than continue one they had. Um, I'd have to look at the specific use case to have a better answer than that, but generally it's about reducing the amount of spans within a span to just like what's reasonable and interesting to, to you and your, your company. It can get tricky because some teams might want more information than uh, typical, but it's just it's got to be about conversations and trade-offs there. But yeah, it can certainly happen. I think that's one of the things that's hardest with open telemetry, which is why I usually leave it till the end in the maturity journey, is it looks cool, but getting it set up takes a few mental jumps and you have to really understand how to instrument it. And if you get it wrong, I actually find it sets people backwards because it puts them off because they spent time on it and they didn't get it where they wanted. So it's best to kind of take the path that I, I defined, I think. Cool. Thanks, folks.